Welcome to Cold War Liberals. This course is about uh, intellectuals on the left who were critical of, who condemned, who fought against the Soviet Union. Uh, you can describe them as socialists against Stalin or Stalinism, liberals against uh, Stalin. It's something I've been wanting, uh, working on for many, many years. This group of intellectuals uh, actually uh, forms a notable current in the intellectual history of our time. Uh, and in fact, Kersler, who we're going to be talking about today, was one of the founders, if not the founder, of the Congress on Cultural Freedom, which was financed behind the scenes by the CIA. And, and in fact, these people, have, there's been a rather warped perception of their anti-communism as a result. You know, they were cold warriors. And I think this is, uh, this is a mistake. They were anti-communists, but they were not the intellectual wing of American conservatism or European conservatism at that time. Uh, although in some ways, you could say they were actually the forerunners of neoconservatism. All of them saw that uh, Stalinism posed a huge intellectual and uh, moral challenge to democratic ideals. Uh, which they understood as greater egalitarianism and a more open society. Uh, it was a greater challenge than Nazism, as far as they were concerned. Nazism was obviously evil incarnate, right? It stood for final goals that no progressive could ever endorse, whereas Stalinism did. And that's why these intellectuals opposed it. Uh, our, first, our first writer is uh, Arthur Kersler. Uh, what can we say about Arthur Kersler? Just a bit of background to him. Well, Kersler uh, lived, shall we say, a turbulent life. Uh, he was famous, incidentally, for the razor-sharp parting in his hair. He was a bit of a dandy. Uh, he was born in 1905 in Budapest to a Jewish family. He was German speaking and Hungarian speaking, trained as a scientist. I'm just reading stuff out uh, for the moment and began his career, uh, became quite quickly when he was very young, quite a famous journalist in, in, in Berlin, particularly uh, dealing with scientific uh, topics. Now he joined the Communist Party of Germany in December 1931. And uh, for uh, seven, eight years, he was uh, closely uh, involved in the Communist Party and became one of its best known intellectuals, at any rate, within the Communist Party itself, outside of the Soviet Union. Uh, he remained a, part, uh, a member, in fact, until the spring of 1938, although he continued uh, himself to think of himself as being a fellow traveler or a sympathizer until the Nazi Soviet pact in August 1939. Uh, he wrote about it, his experience of being a party member, in, in, in something I really recommend to you, a book I really recommend to you. His experience is uh, the initiates, is an essay he wrote in a book called The God That Failed which was a collection of essays published in 1949, edited by Richard Crossman, the British, author, the British parliamentarian, about uh, radical left socialists who had broken with uh, Stalinism. Uh, and what's actually really important and interesting and gave him background for darkness at noon was that he in fact was in exactly the same position in 1937, as Rubashov was, uh, his character. Uh, he uh, went into uh, Franco Spain uh, as a news correspondent for an English liberal newspaper, but also to provide intelligence for the world communist movement about what was happening in, behind the lines in Franco Spain. 
He was recognized as a, as a communist and thrown into prison. And he actually became one of the uh, first uh, prisoners of conscience, if you like, uh, and was in fact rescued by an international campaign to get him out. But he spent three months in a death cell, not knowing every time somebody came marching down the corridor that he might be the man who was uh, destined to die. Uh, and he wrote a, a, a very interesting book called Spanish Testament about his experiences in Spain, the second half of which I think is quite a famous work of autobiographical literature called Dialogue with Death, which is about his experience on, on death row, so to speak. Uh, now, just a few words about the background to Darkness at Noon. I'm trying to keep this as briefly as possible, but I really recommend, if any of you have got the time, to read Michael Scammell's marvelous, marvelous uh, biography of, of Kessler, The Indispensable Intellectual, which is absolutely worth reading if you've got a long summer ahead of you. Uh, Darkness at Noon, which is by far his most famous book, was written in France during the so-called phony war between 1939 and uh, uh, the German invasion in 1940 of France. It was translated by Kersler's uh, then lover, uh, Daphne Hardy, who was an English sculptor who spoke very good German. Uh, Kersler, I think it's fair to say, had a fairly uh, uh, varied and uh, length, uh, wide sex life. Uh, and they fled. They had to flee from the advancing German troops. And they took the manuscripts with them. It's a complete miracle the manuscripts survived. It was taken with them when they fled for the south of France and then subsequently to Lisbon. Uh, Kersler actually wrote uh, another famous autobiographical uh, book about this called The Scum of the Earth, which is about how the French treated the uh, exiles, the, the non-French people, many of them Jewish, who were fleeing the Nazis as quickly as they could. Uh, Daphne managed to get on a ship to England, where she translated the manuscript from German and published it in, first in Britain, then in the United States, to greater immediate success. Uh, the uh, success of uh, Dance at Noon, in fact, uh, allowed, uh, allowed Kersler for the first time in his life to be a, bit, a little bit uh, less impecunious, and he actually became quite a famous uh, writer and commentator during wartime Britain. But his real success with Darkness at Noon came after World War II, uh, when it was translated into French, as, as you can see the copy, but that's the original edition, Le Zéro et l'Infini, uh, in which, uh, which, which was an incredible bestseller. France in the immediate post-war period, uh, like Italy, if it comes to that, uh, was wondering whether it's democratic future, whether it's going to have a democratic future. Uh, was wondering whether it will be Gaullist or Christian Democrats, Socialist, Communist. There was a very strong Communist Party and a very pro-Soviet Communist Party. And uh, Kersler's book became a huge bestseller. Uh, over half a million copies were sold within 18 months of its, uh, its being published. Uh, and as a result, he became something of a hate figure for the communists in France, uh, and for fellow travelers like uh, Sartre uh, and uh, Maurice uh, Melo-Ponty, who actually wrote a, quite a famous book called uh, Socialism and Terror in response to Kersler's, Kersler's work. Uh, I don't know if any of you have read any uh, Simone de Beauvoir, but one of her famous uh, Romana Clef, a Romana Clef that she wrote in the immediate post-war period called The Mandarins, it's the English translation, uh, has uh, a rather ruthless uh, parody of Kersler. Uh, he's caricatured as uh, Victor Skriasin, who is a Russian writer, who is a vicious anti-communist. Uh, and uh, that's how uh, de Beauvoir presented her. Uh, de Beauvoir became, uh, Kersler became uh, absolutely committed after about 1946 to resisting the totalitarian temptation uh, and resisting the Soviet Union. Uh, 
and he was really the driving force behind the Congress of Cultural Freedom, organized uh, in Berlin in June 1950, but which ended with him making a passionate speech to speech to a huge gathering of Berliners. Of course, West Berlin was a significant uh, site in the Cold War, which finished Friends Freedom Has Seized the Initiative. It was controversial right the way through his life, actually. I mean, this, the 1940s and early 1950s were the decade in which he was a world famous intellectual. But he continued to be, he lived in Britain and became quite a controversial and quite a significant figure in British and intellectual life. And even died in controversy because uh, he and his wife, Cynthia, who was much younger than him, died, uh, uh, died after a mutual suicide pact in July uh, 1983. So that's a sketch about Arthur Kersler. I can only recommend you to, to uh, read the marvelous book by Michael Scammell, if you want more on his background. But he's an extraordinary figure. Uh, and Darkness at Noon, he's an extraordinary figure who wrote many interesting books. But to be perfectly honest, if he had not read, written Darkness at Noon, and to some extent, Dialogue with Death and Scum of the Earth, he wouldn't be remembered today. Why was this book, which I think second only to 1984, summarize the idea of uh, Soviet totalitarianism in the West. Why, why was this book so powerful? What was so interesting about it? And that's really what this lesson's all about. Darkness at Noon is about uh, a Russian leader, Soviet leader, arrested, thrown into prison. He's a veteran of prisons. He's been imprisoned by the Nazis. Now he's being imprisoned by his own side. He's thrown into prison and he's waiting, uh, and just as so many of the old Bolsheviks, the people who had made the revolution of 1917, between 1935, 1938, 39, these people were being arrested en masse, put into prison, put on trial, sometimes uh, admitting to the most absurd and crazy things uh, in, in front of the attention of the world. America, one, Amer one of America's most famous uh, philosophers at that time, John Dewey, actually carried out a, uh, a commission of inquiry to try and understand how is it that these Bolsheviks are committing such terrible crimes? I mean, what's happening in these trials? You know? Everybody in the world was talking about them. These, these great intellectuals, these powerful figures, were, were, were admitting to having conspired with the Nazis or sabotaged economic production, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Kersler's novel is ultimately about trying to explain this extraordinary phenomenon 